Ice is weird. Just by holding together two blocks of ice only for a second, they fuse to become a single object. This, as a property of solids, is reasonably uncommon, at least in my experience. So how is this possible? Let me know what you think, but the answer is more complicated than it seems, and it relates to another strange property of ice that occurs at its surface, its seemingly unreasonable level of slipperiness. <laughs> We have been debating the quirks of ice's surface for a long time, but to get a good understanding of it, you really want to be able to see what the individual water molecules are doing. This sounds obviously like it should be impossible, and it has been until now. The research team has just released their findings in the scientific journal Nature, collected using a technique that is so sensitive it can feel the spaces between individual atoms, and produce, for the very first time, a picture of ice's surface. But to really understand what this picture tells us, and why ice is slippery, we need to rewind by about 160 years. On its surface, ice being slippery makes sense. When water is spilled on the floor, it becomes a slip hazard. We reason this is because water creates a mobile barrier between our foot and the floor, almost like stepping on a bunch of marbles that tumble along and cause you to slip. You might guess maybe ice is so slippery because it too is covered in a thin layer of liquid water. Maybe the answer is as simple as that. In fact, in the late 1850s, Michael Faraday, one of the most influential scientists in history, particularly across electromagnetism and electrochemistry, tried this exact experiment and concluded the very same thing, which he announced in a talk at the Royal Society. However, there is a problem with this theory. If you conduct this experiment under extreme vacuum, where no liquid layer can be present because liquid water molecules would have evaporated away as there is no atmosphere holding them down, then ice still remains slippery. So what's actually happening? Believe it or not, ice science was all the rage through the mid-1800s to early 1900s, partially inspired by the other observation we've all made, water as a liquid is denser than water as a solid, which is why ice floats on liquid water. This, it turns out, is a really rare property across materials, with bismuth being one of the very few similar exceptions. For water, this is the result of the crystal structure water forms as it freezes. The hydrogen bonds that rapidly connect and disconnect from nearby neighbours in liquid water, as it begins to freeze, the molecules of H2O arrange to form bonds in such a way they create additional space between the molecules. So the same volume of water expands by about 10% as it goes from liquid to solid. In the 1850s, James Thompson, an Irish mathematician and engineer, was examining the change from liquid to solid and noticed that the freezing temperature changed based on atmospheric pressure. Thompson was one of the inspirations of the field of thermodynamics, something I'll never personally forgive him for, but his work did lead us to developing this useful, if somewhat complicated looking, phase diagram of water's behaviour. Here we see what Thompson saw. We can cause ice to melt and become water, either by increasing the temperature or by increasing the pressure. Maybe ice can be slippery in a vacuum, even if its liquid layer evaporates away, because as soon as we go to touch it to measure its slipperiness, the pressure of that touch melts the surface and creates a newly slippery liquid layer. In 1886, John Jolie followed the same reasoning to suggest how ice skaters might glide across frozen lakes. Jolie suggested that the pressure of a thin ice skate's blade is so great because it touches ice on such a small area that it melts the ice to water, creating a slipping layer. In theory, a good suggestion, earning him the nickname John Bon Jolie. However, while the basic idea is correct, you can melt ice by pressurizing it, the numbers don't really work at all. A 150 pound person standing on ice wearing a pair of ice skates exerts a pressure of roughly 50 pounds per square inch on the ice. That amount of pressure lowers the melting temperature from zero to minus 0 0.016666 repeating degrees Celsius, or for Americans, 32 degrees Fahrenheit down to 31.97 degrees Fahrenheit. If this explanation was in fact correct, light objects or ones with large surface area like a hockey puck or a ski would create even lower pressure and shouldn't slip at all. 
And that's a problem because in fact we see the exact opposite. Many winter sports are best below freezing temperature. Figure skaters prefer minus 5.5 degrees Celsius for a slower, softer ice to land their tricks on, whereas hockey players like the cold, hard and fast conditions of minus 9 degrees Celsius. Speed skaters like somewhere in between at minus 7 degrees C. This is also disproved as a primary mechanism by our first experiment. When we press two blocks of ice together, they freeze. Why? would an ice skate against ice become slippery, but ice against ice freezes. Despite this hypothesis's shortcomings, it remains the dominant explanation of slipperiness of ice for over a century, including many YouTube videos about it. So, if pressure is not responsible, what else could be? Maybe it's heat generated from friction. Two surfaces in contact moving relative to each other produce heat. Could this heat be melting the ice to form the slippery liquid layer? Now this will of course happen to some extent, but most practical experience tells us we don't have to be moving much to slip. Instead, it feels very much like the phenomenon that is producing this slipping is already present without pressure and without friction and without heating being required. If this idea of a liquid water layer can't fully explain why ice is so slippery, maybe it's something that behaves like a liquid, but isn't one. And isn't a solid either. When we described the freezing of water into ice, we talked about the hydrogen bonds aligning within the bulk material to create a solid less dense than the liquid phase, where all of the molecules were held in rigid formation, supported by the network of surrounding molecules which are similarly locked in position. This is true everywhere within a solid, except for at the surface, where the supportive crystal structure extends below, but above, the outermost layer of water molecules interact with nothing but the atmosphere, or whatever object they come in contact with. It was at this surface that researchers directed their focus, using a piece of equipment called an Atomic Force Microscope, or AFM, which here is a no expense spared mock-up of one. The AFM has a long cantilever, about 100 to 500 microns long, about the length of the diameter of two human hairs side by side. It's about 30 to 50 microns wide, which is half of the diameter of a grain of sand, and around 0.5 to 0.8 microns thick, which is about the thickness of a red blood cell. I used AFM probes a lot in my PhD, and although they are metal, they are so thin that it's better to think of them as a blade of grass fluttering on the wind than a piece of metal. At the end of the cantilever there is a tip that is usually triangular and goes from quite wide at its base to at its end point just the width of a single atom. You could argue very reasonably that AFM tips are the sharpest objects in the world. This AFM probe is attached to the atomic force microscope itself which then drags the probe along the atomic surface of a material, here represented by these marbles in a tray, and it measures, or really feels, the change in height of the tip as it travels over the surface of of the individual atoms. But how do you sense or feel the bump of going over just a single atom, even though the height change is absolutely tiny? By reflecting a laser beam off of the back of the cantilever and detecting the position of that laser beam a long way away, this amplifies the up and down motion of the cantilever and allows you to measure the bump of going over an atom as well as the gaps in between atoms on a surface. This produces images of atoms that look like this. The research team conducted their experiment at minus 150 degrees C and in a near perfect vacuum, with at the very tip a single carbon monoxide molecule. Under normal conditions, they found that the water molecules are arranged like this, in layers of hexagons stacked one on top of the other, a phase of ice called IH for hexagonal ice. This ice type typically features the oxygen molecule of the H2O facing outward. However, there are also small clusters of a secondary ice type, cubic in nature nature called IC, no pun intended, and the interesting thing happens at the boundaries between these two ice phases. Rather than the neatly arranged uniform oxygen facing outward molecular orientation, as these two types of ice don't nicely interface together, there's a perimeter of water molecules between the two that aren't quite sure whether to orient in a hexagonal or cubic structure and so kind of end up doing their own thing, usually pointing their hydrogen atom outward away from the ice's surface. This is the very first time we've been able to image the surface of ice to this level of detail and see exactly the orientations of the atoms within the water molecules. 
But what do these findings actually mean? This break in structure, this disorder, not prevented or tamed like it is deeper within the solid, creates a collection of loosely bound molecules on the surface of the ice, only held by a reduced number of hydrogen bonds. The suggestion is that these loosely bound molecules can move with freedom not usually experienced by a solid, but aren't quite as free as a liquid either. This quasi-liquid layer may detach and reattach to the surface, acting as we first imagined, like a layer of marbles able to shift and move, creating one of the only solids in the world that slips. But the story is more complicated still. As I looked at these images, there was something that confused me. If you've run an AFM before, you'll be thinking the same thing. How do you drag your AFM tip over something that's slipping around on the surface? During my PhD, I used to image nanoparticles on glass surfaces that I hoped were fixed in place, but sometimes they would detach and what I would image would be a flat plane with a sudden and long line in it as I dragged the atoms along with the movement of the tip. Why don't we see these water molecules slipping around like the marbles that we describe them to be? I had to dig around to find out, but I found a research paper that gives us a clue. Back in 2018, a team of researchers led by Professor Daniel Bonn from the University of Amsterdam, through macroscopic friction experiments at temperatures ranging from 0 Celsius to minus 100 degrees Celsius, showed that surprisingly, Ice goes from extremely slippery as a surface at around 0 degrees C to a high friction surface at minus 100 degrees Celsius. This is why the AFM experiment, conducted at an even colder minus 150, was able to capture such a clear image. It's so cold here, the slippery water molecule marbles are frozen in place. These AFM images also reveal something else. As the researchers increased the temperature, the cubic phase grew across the surface. As the temperature increased, the increased thermal energy drives a change in the mobility of the topmost water molecules. This matches the temperature dependence of the measured change in friction from that 2018 paper. This phenomenon is part of a process called pre-melting, the process that happens before solid ice melts into liquid water, and actually, upon melting, as soon as a real liquid layer forms on it, it actually becomes less slippery, as the highly structured solid ice becomes more easily deformed. The experiments from 2018 showed that the slipperiness of ice is actually at its maximum at minus 7 degrees Celsius, the temperature typically used in speed skating rinks. Putting this all together, this is a very complicated answer to a very simple question of why is ice slippy? It's a solid with an outermost layer that is free to move like marbles across its surface, liquid like in nature, but actually when a liquid layer is present, that becomes less slippery than the solid. An incredibly uncommon behaviour from one of the most common materials on Earth. I love that sometimes it's the simplest questions that make us scratch our heads the hardest. If you like this video, you might be interested in a similar simple question with an answer that we actually aren't quite sure about. Where does gold actually come from? As always, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next week. Goodbye. Okay, do you know how hard it was to get these two ice cubes to actually stick together? You have to become a single block. <laughs> they stick. Well, they stick to become a single block. My fingers are so cold. <laughs> block, they don't, they don't stick. <laughs> What's happening? They turn into a